Hello there, welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical journey through the United States and revisit some of the earliest crimes. But before we talk crime, let's talk coloring. So I Google searched and found this picture of Easter lilies, and this is the color combination I want to try and recreate. So I have selected the Simon Says Stamp Beautiful Lily. I don't think the stamp set is still available, but there's lilies all over the place. And my first attempt at coloring was going to be on a piece of Bristol cardstock with my Zig Clean Clear watercolor pens. I will be stamping in a waterproof ink and heat embossing with clear embossing powder. And when I am finished with the coloring and ready to create the card, I will use the coordinating die set to cut out this flower image. My original intention was to create those um, white and purple lilies with my Zig pens. Um, it was not wholly successful. I just didn't like it. I didn't feel like it was, it wasn't doing what I wanted it to. <laughs> Excuse the whining there. Um, I just could not get the color to blend and fade the way I wanted it to with the colorless blender. I even pulled out a water brush at one point and started fading the color out with the water, but then there wasn't any dimension to it. Um, back to my stamping right here. I am using my anti-static powder tool from the um, Rabbit Hole Designs because I am heat embossing the clear embossing powder. Anyway, back to the coloring. I could not get the fade and the dimension with the Zig pen that I wanted. So eventually I just gave up and I pulled out my Prismacolor colored pencils. And I pulled out like three colors of purple, two colors of green, two yellows. I did also use a yellow glitter pen to add some glitter to the stamen of the flowers. Um, at one point I colored some of the leaves purple because I thought it was another flower. So I had to do a little erasing to take that colored pencil off. Um, when I color with colored pencils, I go from darkest to lightest and back again. And today I used a colorless blending pencil to kind of get that fade I wanted. Once I had the coloring down, I pulled out some acrylic paint pens that have a bullet nib and added the stippling that you see in lilies to get that freckling look. And I do like how it turned out at the end. I am using this to create an Easter card. I'm kind of on a kick with that right now. Um, I think that's all there is about the coloring. So, <clears throat> sorry, allergies are real here in Virginia. Oh, one thing here, I did stick the panel down to a sticky mat because it was a little bit warped after the heat embossing. At some point I take that off because my hand just keeps sticking to the sticky mat and it's driving me nuts. Pulling little hairs off my arms and I don't like that. All right, now that we've talked about the coloring, let's jump into the crime. Our journey today takes us to the state of North Dakota, home to my sister, her, hus her husband and children, and a lot of snow. The Dakota Territory was established in 1861, and it became central to the American pioneers with the Homestead Act of 1862. Traditional fur trade declined in favor of farming, and North Dakota became a boom with the gigantic farms that stretched across rolling, rolling prairies. There was actually a name for this called the Dakota Boom, where they, they, Dakota became a... Um, an economic engine, that's a phrase I think I read, economic engine in the farming of the area. There were some major differences between the people who lived in the northern part of the Dakota Territory and the people who lived in the southern part of the Dakota Territory. The northern part of the Dakota Territory was less inhabited and was seen by the southerners as somewhat disreputable. It was controlled by quote, wild folks like cattle ranchers and fur traders. And in the opinion of the Southern Dakotans, um, there were too many um, conflicts between the Northern Dakota um, residents and the indigenous peoples. Um, the Northern part of the Dakota territory was generally content with remaining a territory. Like they were not pushing for statehood, but 
the territorial territorial capital was moved from Yankton in the southern part of the Dakota Territory to Bismarck in the northern part of the territory. And that, um, that kind of ticked off the Southerners. And at that point, they actually called for a division of the territory. At the 1887 territorial election, voters approved splitting the territory in two pieces, and that division was done right along the 7th Standard Parallel. <clears throat> North Dakota was admitted to the Union on November 2, 1889, along with South Dakota, as the 39th and 40th states. The rivalry between the two states was so um, extra, it's just extra. <laughs> I can't think of another word. It was extra. It was so bad that President Benjamin Harrison actually directed his Secretary of the State to shuffle the papers and obscure from him which of the Dakotas he was admitting to the Union first. So the actual order of whether it was North or South first was unrecorded, and no one knew which one was actually admitted first. So consequently, the two states are officially numbered alphabetically, with North, North Dakota being the 39th and South Dakota being the 40th state in the Union. Now, North Dakota is the least populous, is the third least populous state in the country, but the 19th in area. North Dakota is the leading producer of sunflowers and honey. And on top of that, North Dakota farmers produce enough wheat each year to make 12.6 billion loaves of bread. They produce enough beef to make 113 million hamburgers, and they produce enough soybeans to make 483 billion crayons annually. That's a lot of Crayolas, assuming they're not Rosart. That's still a lot of crayons. North Dakota farmland would cover over 12 million city blocks. On February 17th, 2007, the state broke the Guinness World Record for the most snow angels made simultaneously in one place when 8,962 people began to participate in the event on the state capitol grounds. I don't think that sounded like proper English, but we're just moving on. North Dakota is home to a giant buffalo and a giant Holstein cow statue. And the largest metal sculpture in the world is in North Dakota. The inventor of the camera was a North Dakota named David Henderson. He invented the camera in 1887 and named it by scrambling the first four letters of the word Dakota and adding a K to make Kodak. Just so you know, it is illegal to dance in Fargo with a hat on. It is illegal to wear a hat at a party where other people are dancing. It is also illegal in North Dakota to take a nap with your shoes on. And North Dakota is a place where buying a farm could turn into a creepy venture. Eugene Butler was born in December of 1848 in the Niagara County, New York area. He was one of three sons born to Ephraim and Rebecca Butler, um, a prosperous family from, New from England. And around 1882, when he was about 33, Eugene and a handful of other men from the county decided to take the U.S. government up on its offer of free land on the frontier of the Dakota Territory. They headed west to Grand Forks County and named their homestead town Niagara after their hometown in New York. And this is where Eugene bought a 480-acre farm. Now, Eugene ran this farm on his own. He never married. He lived as a recluse, 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 there's the word, and he avoided contact with his neighbors. He only went into town for business purposes, and then he went to nearby Laramore, North, North Dakota. He did reportedly hire farmhands to help maintain his farm during the summer months, and that seems like a very extreme lifestyle for a man in his 30s in the late 1800s. I mean, it, it just does. Usually by then they were married with, with children, right? In the coming years, Eugene amassed more acreage and became the wealthiest farmer in the area. His estate and holdings were worth over one and a half million dollars in today's money. 
That's a lot of money. But as his wealth grew, his mental health faltered. He was prone to hallucinations and paranoia. He refused to have his photo taken for fear that the camera would take away his soul. His mind deteriorated even further when he began riding out into the night, screaming at the top of his lungs and scaring the county residents. Besides those times when he rode through the town in, at night, he was seldom seen, and very few people actually even dared to visit his home. Most people agreed that he was a sick man. Eventually, his family in New York became aware of his mental health problems, and in either 1904 or 1906, two dates, two different sources, they actually had him committed to the North Dakota State Hospital in Jamestown, known by most known by most people then as the North Dakota Hospital for the Insane. <clears throat> when Eugene was admitted to the hospital, authorities packed up his belongings. They found more than $7,600 in cash, checks, and gold just laying around the house. That would be like finding over $200,000 in somebody's house today. He also was in possession of a sizable amount of government bonds. Later, authorities would go on to say that he was the wealthiest person ever admitted to the state hospital. Once at the hospital, doctors reported he only caused trouble at isolated times. They found he suffered hallucinations and he would ask his attendants if they heard the people talking about him. A um, doctor guest, a physician at the hospital, said Eugene, quote, was a man of small stature, very gallant, and fond of attending hospital dances. He fell desperately in love with one of the lady physicians, and her friends joked with her considerably about Eugene's ardent devotion. Though well, he was likable. Little bit nuts, apparently, but likable. Eugene's final years were uneventful. On October 22nd, 1913, he died of phlebitis, an inflammation that causes a blood clot to form in a vein, usually in your leg. We call this deep vein thrombosis. His remains were shipped to Middleport, New York, where he would be buried by relatives, and then his estate was split among his relatives in New York or sold off to neighbors. Enter Leo and Lottie, and I'm not even going to pretend I know how to pronounce their last name because my German is um, non-existent. Leo and Lottie were new parents to their newest baby or their new baby Victor. Um, recently married, new baby, and Leo was part of a large and hard-working German family who had come from Appleton, Wisconsin to the tiny town of Niagara to farm the rich soil of the Red River Valley. The day was June 26, 1915, and they were just starting their life together when Leo set out to do a little work on their new farm. Now, one source says that Leo was a worker in an attempt to renovate the farm. But the other sources say that Leo actually was working this farm as his own. Anyway, Leo decided he was going to build a, dig a cellar under the existing home. And as he began to dig near the foundation of this home, he unearthed something he could never have imagined. Six human skeletons all of whom had been brutally murdered, obviously brutally murdered. All of them had their skulls crushed, most likely by a sharp instrument, and at least two had their legs broken. Initially, there was a theory that five of the remains belonged to a family consisting of two women, probably housekeepers, and their children, but nobody in the neighborhood ever recalled a family that had gone missing in the county. Later, police revealed that revealed, wowzers, that all the skeletons were actually young men, one of them being a boy between the age of 15 to 18. Another one was a man who had a crooked nose. Authorities could not identify the individuals and suggested that they must have been vagrants employed as farmhands by the previous farm owner. And that was the only explanation they could come up with as to why these individuals were not ever reported missing. So Leo and Lottie and the rest of the people of Niagara were undoubtedly horrified by what was discovered that day. And then the neighbors began to reveal the history of the farm. The previous owner of the home and the farm was a man named dun, 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 Eugene Butler. Eugene, as we've already talked about, was known as an eccentric recluse 
recluse. I can't say that word right. Recluse. He lived alone in the modest home on the prairie that he had built, and he reportedly liked it that way. Supposedly, he claimed that all of the single women in town wanted to marry him. Well, duh, he was rich. And again, all of the, he claimed that all of the men were out to get him. Maybe they were. He was rich. <laughs> he uh, was given the nickname the Midnight Rider when he took up the practice of racing his horse through the town at the middle of the night, screaming at the top of his lungs. Now, the mystery did not seem to be who had committed the murders. It, it just seems to have been a given that it had to have been Eugene because this was his home, because he had built the home, and because he was mentally unstable. The mystery was the identities of the skeletons. So nobody in the vicinity reported anybody missing in the estimated years that the killings took place, which was from between 1884 and 1904. So that's when Eugene lived there. Um, in the earliest days of the investigation, the authorities weren't even sure of the ages or the genders, which is kind of a conflict because they said, oh, they're all men. And then they're saying, yeah, we're not sure. And um, there were a couple of different theories about who these skeletons may belong to. A couple of interesting facts, though, is that it seems that Eugene took off the victim's clothes before he buried them because there was no clothing, not even a button found in the dirt where the skeletons were found. So the assumption was made that he must have burned the clothing and any personal belongings to make it harder to identify them if they were ever found. So without any personal belongings, the only thing investigators had to work with were bones. Um, the bones did tell them that all of the people were killed the same way, a sharp object with, that put a hole in the left side of their skull. Now, in order to hide or dispose of these bodies, Eugene had built a trap door by removing three bottom stones from the house foundation. Then he used black clay and red black dirt and red clay in order to cover up the burial places of the bodies. So he was um, sane enough to know he had to hide the bodies. Now, neighbors told law enforcement off, um, officials that the very few times that Eugene actually spoke to them, the only the only thing he talked about was complaining about his hired help. He thought they were trying to steal from him. So we know by records that Eugene had a lot of money laying around his home. Was it true? Were they trying to steal from him? Did they think he was too crazy to notice? Did Were they not trying to steal from him? And Eugene just, again, was suffering from hallucinations. Um, there was not a lot of answers to that question. Following the, dis the grisly discovery, many onlookers visited the farm in order to observe the crime. Looky-loos, that's what we call them, looky-loos. <laughs> um, sheriff's deputies deposited all of the aging bones into a box, which was then transported to the sheriff's office. However, it was later discovered that some of the bones had been stolen. <sighs> looky-loos, they wanted a souvenir. <clears throat> There was a possible um, lead in the identification of one of the victims, a man named Leo Urbanski, who was a wealthy farmer from Long Prairie, Minnesota, sent a letter to the uh, North Dakota state attorney via his own attorney, claiming that one of the victims might be his brother, John Urbanski. Now, John, who also went by the name John Miller, was a young man who disappeared near Niagara in 1902. Before his sudden vanishing, he had written a letter to his brother stating that he was working for a bachelor in the city. The letter's postmark indicated it had been mailed from Laramore, the town where Eugene had gone to conduct his business. So there has not even to this day been a positive identification made on any of Eugene's victims or alleged victims, because we're assuming Eugene did this, right? According to one forensic anthropologist, that if any of those bones were rediscovered by authorities or surrendered by whomever stole them, they could be identified. Now, keep in mind, this was early 1900s, you know, 1915. Those bones have probably long since been disposed of. I can't imagine anybody's passing that down as a family heirloom. 
But, you know, people are weird. Some people do, I guess. There was another theory about the remains of some of these, or about some of these remains. Um, originally, the authorities could not or did not identify whether they were men or women. And so one theory was that it was a husband, a wife, and three children, and then one single individual. And the rumor, the supposition, the question was, could that family have been one of Eugene's relatives who came to North Dakota to check on him? That was actually ruled out when none of his family members were unaccounted for. So the investigation progressed and they studied the bones and they talked to the neighbors and authorities felt like they had finally um, come up with all the answers. According to a July 2nd newspaper article, Sheriff Turner and Coroner McLean have, and this is a quote from the newspaper, have made a thorough investigation and, re and are reasonably certain that the persons killed included an African-American, the last servant to have been known to have employed by Eugene, two former housekeepers, and their children. So obviously the remains were not all men. A couple of weeks after this, the discovery of the skeletons, Dr. Guest, that physician from the hospital where Eugene was committed, um, talked about Eugene. Um, by the time that the doctor was making his this statement, Eugene was probably medicated. But he did say that Eugene did not seem like somebody who would ever commit murder. In fact, <clears throat> sorry, allergies, Eugene never spoke of murdering anybody. He never spoke of dead people. He never admitted to killing anybody the whole time he was institutionalized. And if he was as unhealthy as we're assuming, he may not even remember doing it. And you would think if he was already suffering hallucinations and paranoia, even to the extent of not wanting his, his photograph taken, that he might have remembered something like that. He might have said something about having killed all of his farmhands, but who knows? You know, they say it's the quiet ones you have to watch out for. But in this case, I think maybe there should have been some questions asked when Eugene started riding through the streets yelling in the middle of the night. Maybe somebody should have said, hey, where's Eugene's farmhands? Haven't seen him in a while. Hey, how come nobody's stopping Eugene? Why is he riding through town in the middle of the night screaming at the top of his lungs? So, yeah, I don't know. Um, it's interesting that in eight, the early 1900s, you know, the 18th, um, 20th century, yeah, 20th century, <laughs> they actually had a hospital for his mental health, a place. Now, it was, he was committed. He wasn't allowed to leave. He had to go and stay and, and, you know, he died there from other medical conditions. But it seems like in this story, the people talked about his mental health openly. So when did it become something we don't talk about? I don't know. Just throwing that out there because we still have a hard time in the United States, at least, acknowledging that mental health is a real problem. I'm just saying, maybe Eugene could have gotten some help before he lost his stuff and killed all the people. Just saying. Um, anyway, I'm almost finished coloring. I am using the yellow pencils here to color in the stamen of these lilies. I do like how they turned out with the colored pencils better than the um, watercolor pens I was trying to use. Um, now I'm going to add the freckling in with the acrylic markers because lilies have to have freckles. And we're going to do that super fast speed. And once we get the freckling all done at super fast speed, we're going to go ahead and add some gold glitter pen to the stamens of the lilies. I did use a dark purple acrylic paint pen and then a light pink because my light purple was a little bit too dark still for the lightest freckles. Once we have the stamen all colored in, I'm going to pull out the coordinating die to cut out this, um, to die cut the, the, lily branch and then we're going to go ahead and assemble the card. 
I have pulled from my stash a light piece of cardstock. This is four and a quarter by 11 inches, scored in half at five and a half to make a top folding portrait style US A2 size card. I do have a piece of pattern paper from Honeybee Stamps. It has some blue, um, sorry, blue, purple flowers on the bottom. Um, which I thought would coordinate well with our lilies. I did decide to trim this down a bit, and I'm using the My Favorite Things Wonky Stitched Rectangle Dies. I love the stitching it adds to this pattern paper. It's exactly the way I would stitch if I used a sewing machine ever, you know, not in a straight line at all. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and um, figure out how I want to put this down. I'm going to use double-sided adhesive to tape down my pattern paper. Um, this is this pattern paper here is why I decided to color those lilies purple because Easter lilies are usually more of the lighter tones than the bright ones that grow in my garden. Um, turning the card base um, sideways to make sure I can see three sides and get it at least visually centered. I'm going to use foam tape to pop up this lily. I will not make you watch me cut out little tiny pieces of foam tape to put all over the back of this thing. But um, yeah, it took a minute to get it all on there. And you can see I stamped on the other side of this piece of paper because paper has two sides. Use both of them if you have to. <laughs> Once I have this popped up, I'm going to go ahead and create a sentiment. I do have this um, stamp set from, let's see, where is it? What's it called? Um, my sentiments exactly. It's called Easter Innies and Outies. It's a, a stamp set that has inside and outside sentiments. I'm going to stamp that Easter blessings on a piece of white cardstock and then I'm going to mount it onto a piece of the same color purple cardstock. I did that off screen because I was zoomed in and you couldn't see what I was doing. So really I just edited it out I guess is what I mean. <laughs> I'm going to put a skinny piece of foam tape alongside the edges of the sentiment strip and then I'm going to wedge it underneath that one leaf and the one petal it took me a minute. I had to get some tweezers in there and get it all centered. And then I'm going to stick a piece of white cardstock or white um, copy paper rather inside the card. This is a light cardstock, so it's not like my pen wouldn't show up, but I just like how that finished look, how that looks finished. Anyway, so here is a close up of the freckles on the lilies because I think they look cool. And even though Eugene said taking a picture would still his soul, somewhere somebody found what Eugene looked like. I know, crazy, huh? Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I know it was a short story. I have a couple of other videos here I think you might like, as well as a subscribe button. If you have not yet subscribed to my channel, I would love it if you did. Leave me a comment down below. Tell me what you think about Eugene. Give me a thumbs up and have a really great day.